Okay. Well, good afternoon and evening to some of you. Thank you all for joining me today. Um, I'm really excited to share with you um, my, my passion for bats, but also a lot of the opportunities that wildlife rehabilitation centers um, offer us regarding their conservation and their biology. Um, I'm going to save some bandwidth. I'm at the local library, so I'm going to turn my video off for the presentation, and then I'll uh, meet back up with you guys for the question portion. Let's get started here. Okay. Let's see. All right. Can everybody see that okay? Yes. <laughs> it looks good, Rachel. Okay. All right, well, before we dive in, um, let me give you a little background about bats and the goals of my research. I mean, other than just my fascination about bats, why study them, right? Well, bats face a wide variety of threats, yet they are still poorly understood. Uh, they also are frequent patients at wildlife rehabilitation centers, WRCs, and at these centers, they offer many opportunities to advance knowledge of bat biology via collaboration. So in order to best understand how to link rehab centers and bats, I reviewed the literature and summarized current opportunities and challenges for rehab centers to collaborate with researchers, government agencies, academic institutions, community members, and other conservation organizations to enhance the knowledge of bats. Um, I will also recommend uh, make some recommendations to improve collaborative opportunities and suggest potential research questions addressable with bats held at these wildlife rehabilitation centers. Um, unfortunately, there are many negative attitudes and behaviors towards bats that have been cultivated over time. So just a few of the many myths and preconceived notions about them include, you know, that they're going to get caught in your hair, a favorite fear of my mom, um, blind as a bat. They're often associated with evil and diseases. Certainly COVID-19 has not helped that. They're thought to be flying rodents, although they're not even, in fact, closely related. Um, but what we do know to be fact about bats is that they have an immense impact on our lives, and many of us don't even know it. So they have tremendous economic value, estimated in the billions of dollars. They're social and intelligent, and they have intrinsic value. They're just really neat and unique creatures. Fortunately, over time, groups like Bat Conservation International have created educational outreach campaigns about bats and their positive qualities. These efforts have resulted in communities better understanding bats, which has led to an upswing of engaged citizens. I personally was fortunate enough to experience that on a daily basis during my time working at a wildlife rehabilitation center in Ohio. But new challenges are still emerging every day. So let's talk a little about what's exactly happening to them. Sadly, bats across the globe are in decline from both natural and anthropogenic causes. A few other threats bats are facing include habitat loss, colony disturbance, wind energy development, diseases such as white nose syndrome, and um, invasive species like feral cats or non-native plants. Um, these are really just the tip of the iceberg. All right, so next to understand wildlife rehabilitation a little bit, let's talk how it's set up. Um, most uh, have basically three phases. So it starts with rescue, which can be opportunistic or targeted. The rehab phase, that's when the patient is actually in care. It could be at a center or even in someone's home. And of course, the goal, release. We wanna get them sent back to the wild if we can. So is there perhaps a fourth R that is missing from the rehab world? Uh, more on that soon. So as far as how centers are organized, they fall along a wide spectrum from small to large. Most centers are nonprofit with varying levels of available resources like personnel and supplies, and typically they're funded by private donations or grants, and most centers are volunteer driven or dependent. So how do bats fit into the world of wildlife rehab? Um, over a 15 year period, for example, a total of 777 bats over seven species were admitted to the Ohio Wildlife Center, uh, the center where I worked, uh, which was a small but busy rehab center in central Ohio. And of these, 33% were rehabbed and released. 
Additionally, over the years, the number of bats entering facilities has risen in many cases. For example, in 2018, OWC admitted 113 bats, which was about a 55% increase from the previous year. In 2019, they admitted 220 bats, a whopping 95% increase from 2018. And last year, about 140 bats were admitted, of which 35% were released. Since bats have low fecundity and are generally long-lived, in certain cases, they have the potential to exhibit immense population level responses to successful rehabilitation, which of course results in helping to preserve bat biodiversity overall. So with the number of bats entering these centers climbing, these facilities are really well positioned to contribute to bat conservation, especially since proactive approaches to conservation are more effective than reactive strategies. Some examples of research opportunities include data collection. Um, this one's huge, and I'll give you a little bit more detail in a second, but basically rehab centers collect data about bats when they arrive. Bats in hand, working directly with live bats provides um, really unique opportunities to measure behaviors that might be difficult to observe in nature, especially since bats are such cryptic species. And my favorite, biological materials. I can tell you from personal experience that rehab centers have no shortage of biological materials on hand. So there's plenty of access to fur, guano, other samples, and many of these just get thrown into the trash on a daily basis. It's a really fantastic opportunity to improve our knowledge of bats and their interaction with the environment and with other species. Now, you may be wondering with all these potential avenues for research, why rehab centers aren't performing their own experiments more often. It's important to keep in mind that the primary mission of these centers is to care for and rehabilitate individual animals to hopefully the point of release. Depending on the size and resource capacity of the center, they may not always have the extra time to devote to research. However, rehab centers do often share amongst each other novel strategies for survival and release. One really cool and relatively new care strategy involves rehab centers housing bats in wine coolers. So you might be wondering what the heck, why would they do that? Um, but since wine coolers were modeled to mimic caves, which have served to store wine, cool, uh, wine for century, centuries, um, it makes sense that they could be converted into mini winter bat habitats. Utilized during the hibernation portion of bats annual life cycles, that this method not only saves rehab centers time and resources, but also allows bats to progress through their natural behaviors. It's, I think, really exciting stuff. So let's dive a bit deeper into what I mentioned earlier about data collection. Almost all rehab centers are required to keep track of patient and presenter records to maintain their permitting. Many of these centers utilize databases as a way to organize and store data. Uh, one database I'd like to hi highlight is Wild One, the Wildlife Incident Log Database and Online Network created by the Wildlife Center of Virginia. This is a free system rehab centers can use for patient and data management and analysis. What's really incredible about Wild One is that it contains participants not only from our nation, but from across the globe. Currently, at least 107 active organizations across five countries are members. That's a lot of information being collected and stored, which has the potential to reveal emerging threats. For example, um, and I just got this data today, so bear, bear with me, but um, the total number of bats from um, 26 organizations across the US and Canada totaled 2,797 2, bats in the year 2019, um, comprising 16 different species. And of these, 40% really were released. So however, you know, this data is available, but it hasn't been really mined yet at all. So for those wishing to collaborate with rehab centers, it offers researchers a chance to gather information and really hit the ground running. So as I mentioned earlier, rehab centers vary regarding personnel and resources. This can sometimes result in inconsistent data acquisition and record keeping, especially when there's a high turnover of staff or volunteers. In order to ensure the value for research and improvement of best uh, uh, care bat, I'm sorry, of bat care best practices, I recommend the minimum information to record for each bat. 
So during admission, the bat species, location were found, and reason for admittance as well as age and sex of the individual should be recorded. Additional helpful factors might include important details necessary to record include disposition. So this is if the animal was released or died, etc. Um, the date of that disposition and the release location, if applicable. Furthermore, by adding a note to each category as to whether the element was confirmed or maybe just suspected, uh, this can assist researchers down the line when analyzing data. When data are extracted, researchers are afforded opportunities to learn about the potential trends or emerging threats that bats may be encountering. Although still highly underutilized overall, the data collected from these centers are increasingly being used in scientific research. Um, examples of, of observations employed might include pathogen occurrences, window and building collisions, vehicle strikes, and invasive predator encounters. So with all of these potential opportunities, could research be the fourth R of rehabilitation? Collaboration between wildlife rehabilitation centers and potential partners could enhance our knowledge of bat biology. Furthermore, because many of the conservation concerns threatening bats are common across many species, collaborations on these studies could really have far-reaching effects. So some of the partners might include scientific researchers, of course. We uh, talked earlier about the immense potential to utilize database records, live bats, and biological materials. Educate, education partnerships, such as local university students, would be a great pairing, too, because these students can practice developing and engaging in research projects, and rehab centers benefit from the availability of really eager and enthusiastic assistance. Um, vet and vet tech students are also a great uh, opportunity to, to pair with re these rehab centers because, you know, each player has a lot to gain from that partnership. So governing agencies and policymakers, aside from providing the necessary permitting rehab centers require to operate, these agencies are also involved with rehab centers when federally or state sensitive species are admitted, um, federally endangered or state sensitive species, um, you know, come into their doors. So governing agencies and policymakers both assist with various wildlife protections, some of which may be influenced by what local or national conservation groups are doing. For example, um, after partnering with the Ohio Bat Working Group and other advocacy groups in Ohio, the governor signed a state proclamation recognizing National Bat Week during the month of October. This positive press towards bats was monumental in continuing the work being done to help change the typically negative um, public perception of bats. Um, and it's coming up soon. I'm super excited. It's October 24th through October 31st. So something to look forward to. Um, the community, of course, this is another huge asset. Rehab centers have the chance to interact with the public on a daily basis. Uh, the knowledge they share regarding bats through personal interaction, education programs, and activism can once again highly influence public perception of bats. Um, especially when they can dispel myths or provide accurate information about these creatures. So as, you know, bat conservation concerns continue to grow, which it unfortunately looks like that's what's happening, it will be really increasingly important to, um, for these centers to partner with other NGOs within their communities. These partnerships can allow cooperation via shared data, advocacy, and in some cases, even volunteers. Okay, so I'm sure you were thinking this all <laughs> sounded too good to be true so far, right? Um, but while rehab centers do offer a wealth of bat data collected annually, published articles on wildlife rehab center databases are still relatively rare. So the lack of standardization of databases and variation in data entry skills can reduce data accuracy, uh, which sometimes creates uncertainty, and that might discourage researchers from using their data. Um, additionally, even when data is entered correctly, rescuers, which typically are just members of the public, can make mistakes and provide incorrect data. Additionally, lack of infrastructure within rehab centers can cause some issues. Once admitted, bats pose challenges atypical of many organisms. Determining the correct species and age of bats requires precise measurements. And typically, there's a limited amount of available staff and volunteers to assist with those admissions. And this is largely due to the costly rabies vaccine, which can be in the thousands of dollars. 
Um, lastly, institutional resistance among organization leaders can also impede the progression of scientific integration within their centers. Um, nevertheless, if these limitations are addressed or documented appropriately, researchers can handle these challenges during, during data analyses. Um, I feel really strongly that they're well worth overcoming for the sake of our knowledge of that. So by now, I hope that I've spurred some inspiration in you all regarding the potential uh, you know, rehab centers have to offer regarding research. Although this is by no means an exhaustive list, I'd like to highlight just a few of the questions myself and other researchers have considered uh, regarding, you know, fat ecology. So what are the most common injuries uh, and sources of mortality for bats entering these centers and how do they vary across landscapes? Additionally, what pesticides or other chemicals are bats uh, are present in bats and do they vary by foraging strategy or location? Um, and one I'm really interested in, what is the post-release survival rate of rehabilitated bats over both the short and long term? And do those rates vary by species, injury type, and geography? In sum, I'd like to share some recommendations both rehab centers and collaborators can practice in order to encourage the advancement of bat biology and conservation through opportunities presented. So on the wildlife rehabilitation side, you can be open to opportunities to engage researchers and others in the mission of your rehab center. Train personnel to accurately and completely enter data from, ba uh, from bat admissions into databases such as Wild One. Seek collaborators who can help train personnel to gather and share accurate data. And encourage collaborators to volunteer at your center to improve their understanding of the challenges and constraints you face when caring for patients. Collaborators on your side, you can be cognizant of the funding and staffing limitations most rehab centers encounter and offer solutions when seeking collaborative opportunities. You can also proactively share new discoveries on bat behavior or healthcare needs from peer reviewed literature. Volunteer, this is a really big one. Please volunteer at your collaborating rehab center to care for the bats that you're studying. Um, additionally, get the appropriate animal care training and vaccines completed prior to approaching centers with ideas for collaborations. And finally, follow through on commitments to make research or other information publicly available. And please give appropriate credit to your uh, Wildlife Rehab Center collaborators. Um, with that, I'd like to thank Oregon State University, of course, and especially my advisor, Doug Robinson, for all his help and the support of the Department of Fisheries, Wildlife, and Conservation Sciences. Um, a huge shout out to Ohio Wildlife Center volunteers and staff, especially uh, Ann and Sherry, for helping me out with some, some details and photos. Uh, the Wildlife Center of Virginia and Wild One staff. Um, my role model, Dr. Donald Burton, the founder of Ohio Wildlife Center. And of course, my friends and family and my husband, Chris, for all their support throughout this time. Uh, so with that, I would be happy to take any questions or comments. I included my information there too, so you can reach out later if we can't get to everybody. Thank you very much. Yay, good job, Rachel. <laughs> Thank you. I hear thousands of bats singing their words of appraisal. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> no, I don't actually, because they're ultrasonic. <laughs> anyway, if anybody has a question, yeah, please post uh, questions or comments in the chat and we'll take a few minutes and have Rachel address those. So I'll, I'll read the chat for you or you can see it too, Rachel, if they pop up and you want to answer them as they appear, uh, feel free to jump in there. Awesome. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. <laughs> This is the silent applause. <laughs> yes. Yeah, this this is one of the drawbacks of the online defense is you don't get the real time uh, yes. applause or <laughs> the look on people's faces, the thought, you know, thoughtful you know, yeah. touching of the, the jaw or forehead. <laughs> we do have a couple of questions coming yeah. in now. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. A couple. What's your strategy, um, Rachel, to uh, track released bats? How would you Yeah, do so that's a great question. And 
that was the the research project I had hoped to do. But um, there have been a lot of advances in technology over the years, and there are little radio transmitters that are actually super tiny. Um, and there are even some now that are being attached to insects, like monarchs, for their migration. Um, so with bats, we can attach these little transmitters. We actually glue it onto their their backs and they'll fall off over time. Um, but those can be tracked with radio antennas. So it does involve um, if the bat kind of, if the baby bat either falls out of the roost or falls off of mom, we can't really reunite them. So in the summer, we got a lot of teeny tiny babies. Um, but in the winter time, it also depended on like the weather, what was going on. So typically in the fall, that's when we start to get our influx of bats. And with the like big fluctuations of temperature, some bats, if they were on their way to hibernating or migrating, and then we'd get a big drop in temperature, they'd kind of get stuck. So we'd have just members of the public like, this bat's been hanging off my window for a couple of days, you know, what, what's going on. So um, those were the ones we would get in and, and keep over the winter until springtime we could release them. Cool. And a couple of fun ones. Uh, okay. How do bats carry their babies when they fly and how do they hang upside down? <laughs> oh my gosh, those are fun questions. So um, bats are, again, why I think they're really cool and fascinating. They're obviously very different than a lot of other mammals and they hang. Um, they just have specialized um, appendages. So their little feet are kind of built to um, hang. And kind of a neat fact about them is to go to the bathroom, they will kind of climb and rearrange themselves so they don't like, you know, go on, on their little face or body. So they, they work around that, um, but they have very teeny tiny little feet um, that are uh, basically have evolved to let them hang. Um, and then as far as carrying their baby, so it again depends on the species. There are some species that will um, carry them on their bodies for at least a, sh a short period of time, usually right after they're born. Um, uh, and again, a lot of times with like tree roosting species like hoary bats or eastern red bats they'll carry their babies for that time um, a lot of the colony roosting bats will create these nurseries and they'll actually leave their babies at the roost um, and that's where sometimes they can you know fall and then they'll be found on the ground or those um, tree roosting bats sometimes they can just fall directly off of mom but um, they kind of just cling right onto their little their little bellies so uh, another question is uh, associated with COVID, mm -hmm. apparently uh, somebody at another center has been discouraging rehab during COVID. Do you, do you think that's a consideration that's important or what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, so there's there's been at the beginning of COVID and, and throughout time as all of us have been learning more about it, um, a lot of the protocols changed a lot. So in the beginning and us rehabbers were pretty sad about that. There was some discouragement in some of the um, state agencies, like I said, that provide permitting and a lot of the rules um, were not allowing that rehab um, because they were concerned about possible transmission. Um, but, you know, as we learned a little bit more about it, we felt safer and some of those uh, rules changed a bit. Um, the biggest concern is actually for us to not um, give the bats COVID. So we were really cognizant about keeping them safe. So, you know, wearing masks and face shields um, is really important just to be as safe as possible. Um, with bats already, we have to be very careful when we're handling them. There's kind of additional techniques and gloves and all of that because of the potential for rabies. Um, but with COVID, it's really about protecting them. How about uh, ideas for funding? Why is bat bat research and bat uh, ecological function not supported more? Any, any I think that, there? yeah, that really comes down to, again, we talked about that perception. So, and, and this happens with a lot of other species that aren't like the face of conservation. Like we all think of the World Wildlife Fund and the cute fuzzy panda or beautiful tigers, you know, these animals that are really, um, warm and welcomed from all, you know, a lot of people. And some of the other species like bats who have these negative myths and bad connotations or, um, you know, snails or lizards or all these like other creatures that they need just as much help too. They kind of are down at the bottom of the barrel for funding because they're not as popular or gregarious. Um, but like I said, that, that has changed and it continues to change. Um, I know like there's all kinds of 
Instagram posts and social media with sky puppies and they're trying to kind of change these perceptions that they are really cute animals. Um, but with bats, it's tough because a lot of them are really specialized with their, their, you know, nasal features for some of these ones that pollinate. Um, and they, they're not the prettiest thing. So that doesn't always work in their favor. Um, but hopefully throughout time, that'll continue to change and they, they will get more funding and support. Fingers crossed. <laughs> Yeah, so maybe related to that, um, there's a couple of questions about whether you actually tried to track and um, what your thoughts are about using MODIS. To oh, do if, that. if I personally have tried to track? Right. So, no, I, I have not yet. Um, I was on the cusp, I was so close, and that was um, right when COVID was starting, and a lot of those regulations did change, so we weren't really. Um, allowed we were still rehabbing them um luckily in ohio um we were never you know not allowed to rehab them but um some of the rules regarding field research and working with them did change um so at that point i had to put things on hold um so unfortunately i personally haven't gotten the chance to i have um witnessed and kind of assisted with some bird tracking which is kind of similar they were like little it's the same thing the little radio tags or nano tags they wear little backpacks rather than gluing it on the creature so i've experienced that with birds a little bit but no i haven't done bats yet i i would love to in the future though i think unless i missed a question i think that's all of them so far you got lots of <laughs> uh, good jobs, lots of pats on the back. You got some requests to give a talk to some other groups and awesome. Thanks everyone. Yeah, for people to somehow get copies of your your paper. And so yes. uh, yeah, well done. Yeah, thank you everyone. Yeah, thanks everybody for coming. Um, if you have any feedback or other questions, I'm sure you can find a way to get in touch with Rachel. Yes, um, I was for, I was yeah, actually going to interject for any of you who are interested or, or I didn't get a chance, if you can please email me um, so that way I don't know if the chat saves when we log out of here and I don't want to miss anybody's contact information. So please email me. <laughs> yeah, and your email is right there on the screen, handy yes. population at Gmail. So yep. uh, awesome. So thanks everybody for coming. Um, we'll give you a couple of minutes to log off or leave the meeting, click that little red button down in the lower right corner. And then when we get down to her committee and, uh, well, just our committee, then we'll...